you, IHF, for inviting me here this evening. Also thanks to Astrid and Alice for all the work they put into organising this series. And of course, thank you all for being here and giving up a gorgeous summer evening. Um, it's wonderful to see so many friends and students. So thank you very much. Now, when, uh, when Dr. Curtis invited me to give this lecture, uh, he asked me to choose a topic that linked Iran with India, or I, perhaps in the Zoroastrian context, to link the, the old country with the adopted country. Today, if you ask the two communities about each other, you may hear from the Parsis that Zoroastrians in Iran have forgotten their traditions, that the full ritual ceremonies of the religion are no longer performed, and there are no madrasas for training priests, that the Zoroastrian villages of the Yazdi plain are abandoned, um, some vanishing without trace, reclaimed by the desert, and that urban Zoroastrians have become reformist in their outlook, and if permitted, would welcome converts into their midst. Iranian Zoroastrians, on the other hand, may tell you that the Parsis maintain a strict orthodoxy for which there is no evidence in the Garthas of Zarathustra, that they've adopted Hindu customs, and that they recite Avestan texts in a sing-song Gujarati accent. Despite these differences, there remain strong ties between the two communities that go back to the time of their separation. The Parsis have maintained an unwavering view of Iran as the motherland. They regard it as the, play, the birthplace of their religion and have turned to it time and time again as a source of authority over their thousand year history in India. And for their part, the Zoroastrians in Iran owe much to their Parsi co-religionists for their survival and revival, particularly during the mid to late 19th century when their numbers in Iran had dwindled to less than 10,000. It was at this time that some of the newfound wealth of Parsi entrepreneurs was channeled into the Iranian Zoroastrian community, its religious institutions, and the welfare of its people. Until then, contact between the two communities had been intermittent, and our information is based on such archeological and textual sources as survived the long period of separation. So this evening, I'm going to look at some of the literature, religious, epic, and poetic that helped to shape Parsi identity on Indian soil while maintaining strong roots in Iran. The texts that I have chosen vary between those that are ahistorical and belong to the realms of legend or myth, and these were likely to have been passed down in oral transmission long before being committed to writing, and those that be can be considered historical and relate to documented events. The themes that link these texts are first, the notion of power and authority, which was vested in the king and his high priest in the pre-Islamic period in Iran, in the Zoroastrian period, and shifted to members of the laity once Zoroastrianism became a minority religion in Iran and later in India. Secondly, the significance of fire, both as a symbol representing truth, or asha, and as an object of worship. And thirdly, the Zoroastrian concept of good and evil, or asha, and its opposite, the druj, or the lie. There are no historical records for the migration of Zoroastrians from Iran to India, which according to Parsi tradition took place some 300 years after the Arab conquest in the seventh century. Nor is the consensus of opinion as to the reasons for their departure. But whatever they were, we know that once Zoroastrianism became a minority religion in Iran, its followers were relegated to the margins of society, losing their wealth and position unless they convert converted to Islam. Many of the fire temples were turned into mosques, the fires themselves often removed and kept alive in a hidden place. For example, according to Iranian tradition, the great Sasanian Atash Baharam Adur Farnbag and the great fire of Istakha were supposed to have been taken to remote, the remote village of Sharifabad on the Yazdi plain, where they were kept hidden from sight in modest mud brick buildings. The Hudinan Peshobais, or priestly leaders of the good religion, who represented the Zoroastrian community to Muslim officials throughout the newly conquered territory, made efforts to stem the tide of conversion. And it was these people 
who were largely responsible for a proliferation of religious literature that appeared in the ninth century, the ninth century of the Christian era, of course. These ninth century books, as they became known as, were written in the Middle Persian, commonly referred to as the Pahlavi language of the Sasanian era. Many of these texts reflected the Zoroastrians' preoccupation with what they perceived as the descent of evil upon the community and dwelt upon the appropriate penalties for such wrongdoings as conversion and the lessening of priestly rituals. They were also concerned with Zoroastrian law and the defense of the faith against Islam. And one of the texts that reflect this period of instability is the Pahlavi book of the righteous Viraz, the Ardaviraz Namag. Although compiled in the ninth century, the story is set in a different era, during the time of persecution of Zoroastrians following the sack of Iran by Alexander in 331 BC. The book describes the journey of the soul of the righteous Viraz to the other world, to determine the nature of its existence and to find out whether or not Zoroastrian rituals are being correctly performed. Upon his return, Viraz relates what he has seen to the religious leaders. Now, I've chosen this text for a number of reasons. First, it became very popular amongst the Parsis in India, perhaps because of the uncertainty of the new environment, the possibility of conversion and losing the knowledge of religious practices. In other words, a repeat of what had happened in Iran. The second reason is that the story highlights one of the central tenets of Zoroastrianism, namely the sharp divide between good and evil and how this is related to the notion of purity and impurity in all things to do with life and death. And thirdly, the narrative repeats a trope in Zoroastrian literature, whereby journeys undertaken by worthy individuals to the spiritual world act as vehicles to express eschatological ideas. Now, perhaps the best known example of such a journey is that of the great high priest, Kirdar, who rose to power during the, the reign of, the, of Shapur I, who reigned from 240 to 272, and remained in post until the reign of Narseh. He is remembered for his campaign against the prophet Mani, his establishment of many fire temples, both state-sponsored and those fond founded at his own expense, and the remarkable rock reliefs and inscriptions that detail his ambitions and achievements. So I wanted to just open a bracket here, um, because the Art of Iraq Namag goes back to the Sasanian period and draws on much of what Kirda talks about. So I'm just showing you this um, slide of uh, his inscription at Naqshi Rajab. Here he's wearing, um, depicted wearing a tall round hat, a necklace of large pearls, both being insignia of rank. And his right hand is raised with finger pointed in a sign of reverence, um, obviously uh, reminiscent of the Frabaha, where the right hand is raised. The relationship between the king and his high priest is nowhere more explicit than this in, in this inscription at Naqshi Rajab, where Kerdar lists the four kings he's served under, saying, I have written this inscription because I, Kerdar, have from the very beginning sealed testaments and agreements about fire temples and magi for kings and lords and have often signed my name, so that at a later time people may know that I am Kerdar, who Shapur I, King of Kings, called Kerdar the Mobed and Herbed, and later, under Bahram I, the Mobed of Ohmazd. So you can see that he has um, an eye on uh, the fact that he's writing something for posterity, and also this trajectory from being um, a simple, well, a, a, a Mobed or Herbed, um, and then calling himself the Mobed of Ohmazd, Ahormazda himself. In several of his inscriptions, including this one at Naqshi Raja, Kirdar recounts the vision of his journey to the other world. And parallels have been drawn between this account and the Adaviraz Namag, despite the some 600 years between the inscription and the Pahlavi or 9th century books. And he explains the reason for his journey, which is to seek affirmation for the truth of Zoroastrian faith. Not only Manichaeism, but also Christianity had attracted converts from Zoroastrianism in sufficient numbers to be considered a threat. 
Hirdar also wished to confirm what happens to souls after death and to verify the doctrine of reward and punishment, depending on the person's deeds during their life on earth. And in his vision or revelation, Hirdar is met at the Chinbat Bridge by his own double, or Han Yir, and the beautiful woman who greets him. He's taken by them to a place where he sees heaven with its golden thrones, and from there to hell, a place full of noxious creatures, Hrafstras. Zoroastrianism teaches um, that it was uh, um, obligatory for people to try and um, uh, do away with and um, extinguish all the, the creation of Ahriman, which included um, snakes and scorpions and all sorts of creepy crawlies. So hell is a place populated by these so-called evil creatures, both real and imagined. So like Kirda, Ardaviraf embarks on his journey in order to seek the truth of the religion at a time when there's confusion and doubt amongst believers. But many of the features of this story are different from those on the rock inscription. So the Pahlavi text of the Ardaviraf Name was, Namag was translated in the 13th and 14th centuries and versions in Persian and Gujarati often contained illustrations of the joys of heaven and the torments of hell. And I'm going to um, go through it, uh, referring to a Persian illustrated manuscript from Nausari in India, dating 1789, which is now in the John Rylands Library. So I'm very grateful to the John Rylands Library for supplying these images, to Ursula Sims Williams for finding this text, and also to Ursula Nargis Farzad for helping with the translation. Um, so we start off with um, Ardaviraf confessing before the fire. He's chosen to go on his journey by a committee of six Dastors or Mobeds, who come to their decision in front of the great Farnbag Far. And here you see him on the left saying his prayers. Um, with the Mobed on the right, before preparing for the journey. After washing and purifying himself with sweet scent and putting on new clothes, he eats food and is given a narcotic that will send him to sleep for seven days and nights. He's surrounded by his seven sisters, who according to the Persian text, were described as being as wives, in other words, close to him, so that they were like uh, his wives. In the Pahlavi version, however, they're described as sisters' wives. They're one and the same. And this is in keeping with the custom of next of kin marriage, or chwedada, that was considered a virtuous union, especially for priests. And you might be familiar with the, um, the Parthian romance, Visu Ramin, where Vis is promised or married to her brother, Viru, by their mother, Queen Sharu who says, I just wanted to quote this from um, Professor Dick Davis's translation, when siblings marry, there's no need to hold a ceremony bright with jewels and gold. Likewise, it doesn't matter in the least if you get married here without a priest. A sibling marriage doesn't even need a witness to corroborate the deed. God and Sarush both know what has been done, as do the stars and moon and shining sun. So I just draw attention to that because this is something uh, that, that goes through all these texts, both uh, in Iran and in India. Uh, in the case of Ardaviraf, he you see him here with um, preparing uh, to go to the other world. Um, he has two of his sisters in attendance. They've admin administered three golden cups filled with wine and a narcotic henbane. And at the back of the picture, we see uh, the six dust tours. So he goes on his way, and here we see him meeting the representation of the soul's good behavior or good deeds, the Dain or religion. And peeping at the scene, you see Ardaviraf himself accompanied by his guide on this journey, Sarush. And here he arrives uh, at the Chinvat Bridge, or bridge of the separator between heaven and hell, accompanied by Sarush, the, who is the god of hearkening or prayer. And he sees Rashnu, the judge, who holds the scales of justice in order to weigh the good deeds against the bad. And he sees Merizad sitting on the golden throne. So then there follow a number of visions of people 
uh, and scenes on their way to Garod Man or paradise. So here we have, um, he sees the court, the court of exalted truth or usher and the throne or seat of the grandfathers. And on the left hand side we see Hamistagan, the level that is neither heaven nor hell and where the good deeds and bad deeds are equal and where the soul stays motionless waiting for the final judgment at the end of time. They go on and see souls at the, waiting at the star level, the moon level, and the sun level, and they see paradise, and they hear the sounds of the soul there. After this, he's shown the souls who perform good deeds, and these are both ethical in the broad sense, for example, being generous in life, telling the truth, being a just ruler, and in the case of women, being obedient to their husbands. There are also more specific acts of merit, such as killing the khastras and being a good shepherd of four-legged animals. And then there are merits assigned to priests, performing najots and yasnas. Um, I've chosen this picture because two of the three, in fact, of scenes of souls in paradise have a cockerel in the background. And it's an interesting motif or detail because the sound of the cock crowing at dawn has long been associated with the divinity of prayer, srasha or srosh, who is also the protector of the Ushahingar, the period between midnight and dawn. And of course, he's one of uh, Ardaviraf's guides in the story. I want to bring your attention here also to the same motif um, shown in a uniquely illustrated Persian manuscript of the Islamic Miraj Name. This is dated 1436 and is held in the Bibliothèque Nationale. And this picture describes the ascent of the Prophet from Jerusalem through the seven heavens, and it draws on Zoroastrian, Jewish, and Christian apocalyptic traditions. What's interesting here is the inclusion of the white cockerel, the Pahlavi Khrush. And the Prophet is informed by his guide, Gabriel, that this is the cockerel that keeps track of the hours of day and night, whereby people on earth are reminded of the time for prayer. So exactly the same role as that of the cockerel in the Zoroastrian tradition. I should mention, perhaps, there's been a lot of um, scholarly work devoted to the question of whether or not the Aravirath Name has influenced the Islamic and Christian apocalyptic traditions. But um, no definitive conclusions have been reached. I just thought it was interesting to see um, visual representation of these accounts. So following his... Um, visit to paradise, Ardaviraf is taken down into the other world, which is depicted very differently. Um, Srasha and Ardavahish uh, take him um, to where he can see the river of Tar and the ditch filled with the tears of men and the souls who've fallen into it. On the right here, we see the unfortunate soul um, falling headfirst from the Chinvat bridge into hell. And then on the left, is the evil behavior of the soul described as the antithesis of the beautiful woman, an ugly hag, filthy and stinking. So the vision of hell contains many souls in a pitiful state undergoing various forms of punishments for bad deeds. And in this copy um, of the Adarirath Name, more than half the pictures are devoted to these sins and punishments. And Adarirath questions his guides as to what these are. So the answers give us some insight into the way in which the religion was defined in early Islamic Iran, possibly to ensure its separation from the new faith that eclipsed Zoroastrianism. And the emphasis on purity and ritual was presumably carried over to India, where the text continued to serve its purpose, which was to give the Zoroastrians a clear sense of their identity, a tiny minority amongst Hindus and later Muslims and Christians. So I've juxtaposed some of the, the good and bad deeds. We'll just go through it very quickly um, to just show you this, this profound dichotomy between good and evil in Zoroastrian religious thought. Um, so here we have uh, the souls of the generous people who are seated on thrones and wear golden crowns, and opposite, the soul of the ill-omened, um, unfortunate miser, on the right, we have souls of the kings who've shown people justice, and on the left, the soul of an unjust, tyrannical, and oppressive king. So the colors are completely different, and there are all these fantastical uh, creatures and tortures um, for, uh, 
which are meted out as punishments. Um, here we have the souls of the Dastoirs and the Mobeds who were truthful and opposite the soul of the liar. And we have souls of the women who were obedient to their husbands and on the left a soul of a woman who did not obey her husband's command. <laughs> so, as you might imagine, women responsible for a good, were responsible for a good many more sins than their male counterparts, often for breaching purity laws. Punishments for adultery, on the other hand, seem to have been handed out equally um, to men and women. And here again, I'd just like to show you an image from the Miraj Namir, where the prophet beholds the gates of hell. The women you see there have been strung up by their breasts, their punishment for committing adultery. In a similar vein, and I'm not sure you can see this terribly clearly, um, but this is um, uh, from uh, the, uh, Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, and it shows Dante with his guide, Virgil, witnessing naked thieves who are being tormented by snakes. The one on the right is being attacked by a serpent breathing fire. So one of the significant um, differences to note between the Arabi Rafname and the Islamic and Christian concepts of hell is that there is no fire in the Zoroastrian vision. Of course, this would be um, you know, a terrible uh, thing to imagine, the fire, the representative of truth, uh, the creation of Ahura Mazda actually being um, uh, in hell. So all we have in the Zoroastrian hell are cold, bitter cold and um, foul smells. So the Ardavir Afname ends with Siraj um, and Ardavahist bidding goodbye to the righteous Viras and he returns to the world to recount what he has seen. So this text is likely to have been used in India as a, as a, as a pedagogical text, reminding people of the values uh, and practical obligations endorsed by their religion. Uh, I mentioned that um, there are no historical accounts of the departure of Zoroastrians from Iran to India, and scholars have speculated that it was the interest of trade rather than religious persecution that prompted Zoroastrians to leave Iran and build settlements in India. We certainly do have evidence of maritime trade between India and Iran, going back to Sasanian times. The Parsi popular account, on the other hand, describes um, the flight from Iran as an epic journey that was undertaken to escape um, persecution. But the first evidence that we have of sustained communication between the two communities is preserved in a corpus of text known as the Persian Rabayats, or letters. These consist of 21 letters written by priests in Iran in answer to questions put by priests and laymen in India. They date from the late 15th to the 17th centuries, and they're a repository of knowledge about the faith as practiced both in Iran and India at the time. And the questions and the answers cover a multitude of law, laws and practices and doctrines. Now, it's not clear why the Parsis um, sought the authority of Iranian priests some six centuries after leaving that country, but by this time the Parsi community had divided into five pantaks or parishes, each with its own priesthood. And it, it seems possible that if much of the tradition was still preserved orally, um, that some uh, of the knowledge, shared knowledge, uh, had been lost and there might have been a breakdown in communication. In ev any event, we can assume that by the late 15th century, there was a growing awareness amongst some Parsis that there was distinct gaps in their religious knowledge regional differences in the practice of rituals and a diminution of priestly scholarship. So we know, for example, that Pahlavi had remained the language of ritual in Iran and that this appears to have been lost in India, although the Indian, uh, in India the Parsi priests still knew Avestan. Um, the author of the Rivayat, writing back from Iran, urges the Parsi community to send over priests to learn the language and witness the correct performance of rituals. Books were evidently not considered a substitute for priestly instruction. He writes, It's difficult for us to send instructions, and we're afraid that there will be additions and omissions, and these helpless ones, the Parsis, will be responsible for the sin. We have no confidence in sending books. 
So we have the Rabbayats showing the Parsi desire for knowledge of religious matters, but the next text I want to look at shows their need to secure their identity as a community in India. In other words, to commit to writing a narrative that tells their story, who they are, why they came to be there, where they came from, and why they're different from everybody else. The Kisei Sanjan, or story of Sanjan, is an epic narrative that originates in India, but which imparts a strong sense of Iranianness, for want of a better word. And it encompasses the themes I've mentioned insofar as it recalls the heroic Iranian imperial past in which kingship and priestly authority was strongly linked. And there's a journey metaphorically beset by evil, followed by just reward. And then there's the establishment of the Iran Shah, or the King of Kings, the first great Bahram, or victory fire, in India. Uh, the Kisse Sanjan has long been viewed by Parsis as an historical account, but is perhaps better viewed as an account that gives us a valuable insight into way, the way in which Parsis perceive themselves and wish to be perceived by others. They'd left Iran physically, but remained strongly attached to it, mentally and spiritually. In what is the most up-to-date translation and commentary of the text by Alan Williams, he points out that the title, Kaseh Sanjan, was not the given title in old manuscripts of the work. In one of these, it is simply described as the beginning of the tale of the Zoroastrians of Persia who came from the homeland of Iran. And he notes, as he notes, the starting point of the tale is not the journey itself, but, the, but King Vishtaspa's days, when religion's path was brought to light by holy Zoroaster. In other words, a time beyond history, for which there's no written record. But the journey proper begins with a group of like-minded Zoroastrians from Khorasan, you can see on the map, making their way down to the port of Hormuz, where they are said to have remained for a hundred years, before embarking for Hind. And I quote briefly from uh, Williams's translation. The author of the text, a dust door by the name of Bahman K. Gobad Sanjana, relates how, when kingship went from Yazdegerd the king, the infidel arrived and took the throne. From that time on, Iran was smashed to pieces. Alas, that land of faith gone now to ruin. And at that time, all those who fixed their hearts upon the Zand and Parzand were dispersed, when every layman and dust store at once went into hiding for religion's sake. Left homes, lands, gardens, villas, palaces. They left all for the sake of their religion. So when they reached um, near to the coast of India, the, the, uh, the group of Zoroastrians um, alighted on the island of Div, or Dhu, and they remained there Supposedly, they remained there for 19 years, according to the narrative, until the old Dastur, consulting his star charts, determined they should sail again. This time, they were not so fortunate, encountered a violent storm, during which the priests on board took an oath to an establish an Atash Bahram, or victory fire, should they arrive at their destination unharmed. And so the tale continues. Now, I just want to um, focus briefly uh, on the great battle scenes um, in, this, uh, in this text. Um, they take place in the second part of the narrative, and they're between the Muslim Uluq Khan and the Zoroastrian hero Ardashir. This is obviously after there's been a, a, the, the, the group has arrived and settled um, in, the, in the town that they named after a town in Iran, Sanjan. Um, and perhaps we, sh we should note here that the battles described are probably a conflation of, of several encounters between Hindus and Muslims during the reign of Sultan Mahmud Shah I of Gujarat, who reigned from 1459 to 1511. The significance of these scenes, um, and as Williams has pointed out in his book, is that they're strongly reminiscent of the epic Shahnameh, both in terms of style and content. In dramatic scenes that evoke the ancient yashts, or hymns, the Zoroastrian hymns that describe the exploits of heroes and kings. In the Avesta, the Zoroastrians of Hind are summoned to aid the Hindu Raja, and together they muster their armies to face the Muslim warrior, Uluq Khan, the right-hand man of Shah Mahmud. 
The great Zoroastrian hero of the battle is Ardashir, and it is he who seeks to avenge his people for their historic defeat by the forces of Islam. And I refer you to William's book for the detail of the similarities between the two texts. But I'll just give you a flavour of the verses that describe this event um, that is so evocative of the tragic encounter between Rostam and Sohrab in the Shahnameh. So both armies uh, prepare for battle. The Hindus and 1400 Zoroastrians on one side and the forces of Ulul Khan on the other. And I'm just reading from, uh, from this translation by Alan Williams. White dawn shone forth out of the gloomy night. The starlight banished to the deep abyss. Then Ulul Khan and all his cavalry put on their mail coats and approached the plain. They put bejeweled saddles on the horses, unfurled their banners on the elephants. They saddled up the horses for the battle. The field was shaken by the elephants. The leaders of the troops prepared their forces. The arms of war were everywhere unsheathed. Just when the mighty armies were drawn up, they blew their brazen trumpets on the plain. An army was arrayed on either side, one for Islam and one for the Hindu prince. That night and day were stunned to see that sight. The horses galloping exhausted them. Two hostile forces ranged against the other like crocodiles or leopards locked in combat. The world was turned to pitch by blackened clouds of swords and spears and arrows raining down. There were so many slaughtered on both sides that every inch of plain was strewn with corpses. So following the fierce battle during which many on both sides are slaughtered, it becomes apparent that the Hindu camp had emptied, leaving no reinforcements. And it's at this point um, that Ardashir enters. At once the glorious Ardashir spurred on his swiftly charging steed towards the field. All at one leap he sprang up to the front. He clutched a spear of iron in his hand. His body clad in mail, he drew his sword. At first the arrows rained down everywhere. The order of the troops was torn apart. The world illuminating sun was hidden, and who could say if it was day or night? The solar eye was blinded by the dust, and all around man fell on fellow man. You might say all the world was smeared with pitch, all struck with arrows glistening like di diamonds. The land and sky turned deepest red and black. The earth was tulip red with soldiers' blood. So the battle raged for three days and nights, ending with the flight of Ulul Khan and his men. And we hear that Islam had fallen on that battlefield, slain in the battle with the noble prince. And in the black of night, Ulul Khan fled. He gave no thought of his accoutrements, and all of his battalions fell and staggered as they withdrew in flight from Ardashir. So many of the foe fell in the fray that at the end, at the end of it, he was victorious, and all the tents and weaponry and chattels came into the control of Ardashir. However, the following day, Ulul Khan gathers his troops again for battle, and Ardashir called out the Muslim commander and slays him, whereupon Ulul Khan determines to leave no Zoroastrian alive, wreaking his revenge. And there follows a bloody battle in which Ardashir is eventually slain uh, along with the Hindu princes. Alas for such a valiant commander, whom fate had scattered to the winds at last, when inauspicious fate had turned to anger, the very hardest stone is turned to wax. And even though he fought and struggled so, to what avail if fate had turned away? But the narrative doesn't end on this despairing note, but goes on to describe the escape of um, the surviving Zoroastrians to a nearby hillside. And from there, they moved to the town of Banza, taking the sacred fire um, with them. And the final chapter of the story recounts the triumphant arrival of the Iran Shah, the King of Kings. Um, to the town of Nausari. We don't know the origins of the term Iran Shah for the Atash Bahram, but one of the Rivayats does um, refer to the, the sacred fire of Kerman being called an Atash, being called the Iran Shah. Uh, but clearly, Bahman Khekobad sees in this ancient fire the symbolism of kingship and the divine right to rule that had been lost with the Arab conquest of Iran. 
So the history of the Iran Shah is continued in another Persian text, the Khasei Sardoshtiani Hindustan. And this was written by um, some hundred years after the Khasei Sanjan. And this whole text talks about a dispute between the two priesthoods. So the Sanjana priests bring their sacred fire to Nausari, and of course they're paid to tend it, but then you have the Bagaria priests, who are the resident priests of Nausari, um, who are, whose job is to um, perform all the rituals for the population of Nausari. And of course they fell out with each other, and um, there was a bitter uh, quarrel that lasted some 200 years. But then the, the rest of the, and in fact, lives were lost over this. I mean, it was really about economics. Um, but um, the, 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 the latter part of the story describes in full detail um, the fundraising uh, effort to, um, to, ha to build a new fire temple in Nausari. And this was uh, finally established in 1763. And uh, of course, it's not only the building for the fire temple, it's the uh, ritual, uh, the rituals that go with building and making over up to two years, the ritual fire to be enthroned in the building. Um, so the Kisei Sardoshtiyani Hindustan goes on to describe this process. And meanwhile, the Sanjana priests are forced to leave Nausari and they take the Iran Shah with them and it's established in Udvada where it remains to this day. So this brings me to the final text I want to consider, which in a sense is the lay counterpart to the Kasei Sardoshtian, since both texts appear to be describing the same event, i.e. The, the establishment of this great fire. It's the only text in Gujarati, and it's different from the others because it was composed by laymen, not by priests, in fact by two brothers. It's called the Atashnugit, or Song of the Fire, and it describes the construction of an agyari, or a house of fire, and the formation and the consecration of the Atash Bahram that is installed within it. In a sense, the recital of the song, um, with its accompanying ritual, is a reenactment of this event. The stated purpose of the song is to make merit, to attract rewards. And in the text, there are frequent references to the families of those who commission its performance for auspicious occasions, such as a wedding or a naujot. The goyans, or singers, are women, and there is one leader who sings or, or chants the song while the others repeat the refrain after every line, which is, O oh friends, let us go to the fire. In other words, those who are not friends, i.e. not Parsis, are not included. So this is a text very much about spelling out who the Parsis are the naming of fam families, the naming of professions, um, affirming the identity. And in the song, people are called to perform certain tasks to do with the building of the Agiari. There's a reference to the family priest and to the sacred garments, the sudra, the kusti, the topi, the padan, and to the donation of money for the establishment of the fire itself. So, this involves the elaborate ritual purification of 16 fires, including the fire of the potter, the brickmaker, the goldsmith, the hearth fire of a priest, and a fire called, caused by lightning. And these are all listed in the Rivayats and also in the Avestan um, text of the Vendidad. Priests play an essential part in the process. So I'm just reading a few lines from the song. Let us ask the dustor to consecrate the patru, or friend. This is one of the rituals um, associated with Sraush. Let us get milk, wine, and pomegranate. Let us do the jashan for the agyari. Let the whole anjuman partake of the consecrated food. Let us call the son of the poultry farmer, O friend, and let us get a crowing cock. With this crowing cock, the atash bahram will be awakened. Let us call the son of the shepherd, O friend, and get a pair of goats. We're reminded that the yasna, or priestly act of worship, is performed regularly, and that priests still turn to Iran for instructions. Let us get sacred books from Iran, O friend. Let us ask the dastors to recite them, begin the work of the ajashni, begin the vendidad, begin the consecration of srosh, begin the work of the religion. 
In another part, the uh, heroes from ancient times are invoked, and their names are mentioned alongside uh, those of Parsis. So this was a song that probably began oral transmission, and there were fixed names that belonged, if you were, to, like, to the Iranian um, part of the narrative. And then the fluid part would be um, different names of Parsis who happened to be commissioning the song. So here it says, we have invoked Dada Hormazd, we, we took the name of Jamshad Padshah, the king. We've taken the name of Rustam Pahlavan, a hero. But then Dadi Seth has been remembered. We've remembered the Modi family. We've remembered Hormuz Jiwadia. We've remembered Framji Kawazji. All these people have done meritorious acts. That is, they've all built apiaries. All these people have gone to the house of song, paradise. So when everything's been built and decorated and paid for, there begin the various rituals for the consecration and enthronement of the great fire, the Iran Shah, in all its kingly glory. Let us call the son of the coppersmith and bring the copper benches. Let us call the son of the goldsmith, O friend, and get the silver throne. Fetch the silver pots, felt, fetch the silver roof, fetch the silver Toran, fetch the silver beakers. Let us enthrone the Atash Bahram. Let us build the roof of the Agyari. Let us call for the silver ladle. The Atash Bahram has been born on Adurmar and Adur Roj. On Adabahishmar and Sarosh Roj, the Atash Bahram was enthroned. So I think the, the important aspect, the distinguishing feature of this song is that it refers to members of the laity, it lists the community, the families, the craftsmen involved in the building of the fire temple, but also to those who have endowed the fire. It marks the beginning of, perhaps, the beginning of an era of philanthropy and wealth amongst the Parsis of India that was to, to change the way they perceived themselves, were perceived by others, and their relationship to their homeland. And there was a shift from then on in the balance of power between priests and, and laymen. Now, I just want to end with um, where I began, which is um, a personal view. And this is taken um, from an interview that I did with a very dear friend and colleague who actually uh, worked with me and translated um, the first manuscript that we found of the Atash Nugit. And her name was uh, Mrs. Shanaz Munshi. Sadly, she passed away a few years ago. And she's still talking about her very first visit to Iran. And she was taken there by somebody who's, some of you in the audience know, Kojaste Mistri, on one of his tours. She says, I think that whatever has happened in my life is a kind of baraka, a blessing or merit that I have earned. I didn't do any of this with the thought that I'd get something in return, but I think I've been rewarded along the way, and I think that Iran was one such reward, because I don't think we could have gone to Iran on our own. This group became like an extended family, with Kojaste leading us, and again he opened new doors. It was the first time that we were exposed to these very beautiful spiritual fires. And for me it was especially important because we went as a family with only four of us together, and Pashna, was the youngest in the group. And I kept on telling her to realize how privileged she was to get this kind of exposure so early in her life. I remember that at Nakshi Rustam, we had a heated debate because one part of the group thought that the kings were very cruel. And how could you call them true Zoroastrian kings if this is what they did? They killed for territorial gain. And the other group felt that this was what kingship was all about. This is what kingly authority meant. I remember both children taking part in the discussion, and when Pashna was asked what her views were, she said with great conviction that, I can now go back and tell my friends when they ask me, what do you have? What is yours? I can tell them that this is mine. This is what I have seen, the experience and the heritage. Knowing that these are my kings, this is where my people have walked. On this very spot where I'm sitting, maybe a king went by on his horse. I felt that too, and with it a sad feeling that there was so little left, and the responsibility to try to build it up again. It heightened the feeling that this has to be preserved. Thank you. <laughs>